Thank you. Thank you uh, to everyone who's already spoken. I know we're running on Sephardic time. Uh, this is actually the last part of our program before there's, there's some uh, Middle Eastern sweets. Uh, but I think it's, it's an important way to end because we will be talking momentarily, briefly, with some of our, the next generation of our leaders. So once again, uh, my name is Ruben Shimanov and I'm the National Director of ASF Safari House. Uh, we are a, a movement um, that emerged an initiative out of the ASF to infuse the warmth, wisdom, vitality, and diversity of the Sephardic experience and the Sephardic spirit to bring that energy into Jewish life on campus as a way of empowering Sephardi students, but also as a way of enriching all Jewish students on campus, and also creating important bridges between Jewish students and non-Jewish students. And as Jason mentioned before, this work is more critical than ever before. I just want to quickly say uh, one thing that we recently uh, did together, a very powerful, immersive experience, was a national Shabbaton leadership summit that we had for our Sephardi House Fellows. We're in the fourth cohort of our Sephardi House program, bringing together students from coast to coast, universities like UCLA, the CUNY schools, Columbia, NYU, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Yale, Harvard, Berkeley and so on and so forth, representing the true diversity of the greater Sephardi world. And we came together for a Shabbaton of community building, of healing, of Jewish Sephardic joy, and of learning. And we're very blessed that we actually had um, the NYPD there for us as we were walking down the street in downtown Manhattan visiting different Sephardic synagogues on Shabbat the NYPD was there for us. Um, and it, this does show that in moments of crisis, both in the past and in the present, um, there are allies like Zainab Khan who spoke, who are there, who understand our stories and both our traumatic moments and our moments of resilience. And so with that, I would like to invite four students, four of our Sephardi House Fellows, onto the stage for a brief conversation about how uh, the mass migration and forced exodus and exile of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa impacts intergenerationally Jewish students from these backgrounds. So I'd like to invite Rachel Dweck, Tehila Soleimani, Yael Kanaan, and Julie Saadia, please. And as they are coming up to the stage, I want to mention that uh, Tehila Soleimani studies at the Fashion Institute of Technology here in New York. Yael Kanaan uh, recently graduated from Carnegie Mellon. Rochelle Dweck has graduated. About to graduate? Graduated from Syracuse? Graduated. Graduated, yes. And Julie Saadia is at Baruch College. Um, they represent different cohorts, some from the first cohort to the fourth. Devir was also in our first cohort. And again, bravo for, for your musical uh, talents. Um, and they represent the true diversity of the greater Sephardi Mizrahi world, representing Persian, Yemenite, Egyptian, and Syrian Jewish experiences. So thank you all so much, and thank you for your patience as we conclude on this important note. Um, my first question to you all is, uh, I would love to have you share a little bit about your family's story in places like Iran, Yemen, Egypt, and Syria. Uh, before they left, what was life like for them? What was li life for them like before their departure from these places where they've had deep roots for centuries, if not millennia? Anybody can begin. I can start. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie. Um, so I'm actually Syrian from both sides of the family. My grandma is here with me. Her parents came from Syria. <laughs> Um, but my dad and his side of the family came here a little bit more recently. They came in a later, um, later wave of immigrants from Damascus. Um, so they actually did not, they did, were not permitted from leaving. They weren't given passports. And on their IDs in Syria, it, it said, um, what was the word for it? Um, 
Musawa. Musawa, yeah. Um, which means like the followers of Musa or Moshe. No, none of the other religious groups had their religion listed on their identification. It was there for police when they get pulled over or when they're just on the street to be able to identify them as Jewish. Um, they were not at times, like especially during the 67 war and the Yom Kippur war as well, they were not allowed to travel within a three block radius from their homes. Um, they also had a uh, special police called Mukhabarat that were specifically there to watch over the Jewish communities. And um, they, and my grandpa shared some stories with me today that were like horrifying. Um, he was a teacher in the Jewish uh, school in Damascus. And um, I, he remembers this one time early on in his career, um, he was called out from the school by the Mukhabarat to watch the burial of Jews who tried to flee to Israel. They were not allowed to leave the country, and especially if they were fleeing to Israel and got caught, they would, they would either be sent to jail or put to death. Um, these teenagers' bodies were sent to their families in bags. They were mutilated beyond recognition, so. Um, yeah, it was very hard for me to hear that today. But anything else that I wanted to mention? Yeah, so. There were other instances where Jews were just attacked in the streets um, with rocks, with stones, with knives. So um, my family is very happy in the 90s when they were permitted to leave and um, came to America. Um. Hi everyone, I'm Tahila. I want to first thank the two other Iranian women that spoke and gave their perspective about what it was like, their first hand perspective, to be an Iranian Jew living through revolution, living through war. My father is here today, he has a very interesting story. He grew up in the south of Iran where he was a very religious Jew and he tells me stories about discrimination where hot days in the summer in Iran, in the south, in the desert, he wasn't allowed to drink water from a well because he was Jewish. My grandfather, who grew up in Kashan, tells me stories about how in their basement they had somewhere where they could hide if people came hunting for them so that when they opened their homes and they raided them, they wouldn't find Jews there. And things were very good at times under the, excuse me, under the Shah, but in a moment they could change completely and their lives would be completely changed. My father had to escape with his sister, with his mother. My mother stayed and came in 2000, um, not without difficulty. And yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you guys so much for sharing your stories. It's an honor to be sitting here with you guys and um, to be supported by WJC, American Sephardi Federation. Thank you so much, Ruben, for reaching out and for the Safra Center for having us and giving us this space to speak about our stories and our experiences. Um, I would like to shed some light on the the connection that my family in Egypt and Syria felt to their land and how they really saw Syria and Egypt as their homeland. Um, my great, 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 great grandfather on my father's side was actually the chief rabbi of the great synagogue of Aleppo, which was home to the Aleppo Codex. It was like the central synagogue in Syria. Um, and he led the congregation. He was actually, um, through like an anti-Semitic anti act of aggression, made blind, um, getting eye surgery. So he was actually a blind rabbi, but continued to serve his congregation um, in the great synagogue. and. Um, was a pillar of the community, so I'm really proud um, of him and that story to come from that. But also my family in Egypt, were, they were very proud Egyptians, as Egyptians are very proud of their Egyptian culture. My grandfather had a tie factory, he made ties for Balmain, um, and they really did see Syria and Egypt as their homes in them. Um, I'm going to talk about later how, you know, it sort of all turned around and they were expelled from their lives. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, my name is Yael, um, and my father's side of the family is from Yemen. Um, and I, I think it's a pretty interesting story. My great-grandfather, his name was Sharon, 
Um, he had many children, and he was uh, quite a prominent figure in the village that he lived in in Yemen. He was not only a rabbi, he was a healer, he was a med, he was a butcher, and he, you know, did not discriminate. He healed both Jews and um, Muslims. He had a really, he was also a mathematician. That was his um, primary skill. And it was recognized by the imam of the area, so much so that he was the tax minister for the imam, and he had a really great relationship with the imam. And as things you know, began to go sour in Palestine, and the tension was rising in the Arab world, the imam actually protected my great-grandfather and sent soldiers to make sure that he would be protected and the family would be protected. But as things got worse, he told my grandfather that he could no longer protect him and his family and that they needed to flee. And so my grandfather, my great-grandfather, took the entire family and they fled to Aden. And that's where they met up with his oldest daughter, um, because she had married very young and she needed to flee with her husband. And she was so incredibly, incredibly great. Her name was Machel. She was only 13 years old. and. Um, riots started over in Aden, and they tried to kill her husband. And she knew that they were all religious Muslims. And so she threw herself on top of her husband because she knew that they would not want to touch her. And she saved his life. He managed to survive with only losing an eye. And she was scratched up a little bit, but they were able to escape from Aden to Israel. Thank you for sharing all of that. My second question, and some of you have already started to uh, answer it uh, a little bit, is if you can tell us a bit about, because I know these stories are multi-layered and each of you uh, can and should have a platform of your own to share it, but here we're just getting a taste of this. If you can share a bit more about your family's exodus. When, why, and how did they leave? And were, how they were able to be resilient in such, in the face of such adversity and trauma. Sure, I could start. So um, my grandfather, um, he was his name is Maurice Aziza. He was um, expelled from Egypt for the mere reason of being Jewish. He was given a day to leave. Uh, all of his assets were confiscated, including his tie factory. Um, and I think a beautiful story that my mom told me that really resonated with me was uh, he was sort of negotiating with the Egyptian officials about his factory and he, he decided that in exchange for showing them how to use the machinery in the factory, they let him take a Sefer Torah with them home. And then we ended up donating it to my elementary school, Barakai Yeshiva. So that was a beautiful sort of you know, circular story of like survival and um, just one that really connected with me. So. Mm. Mm. So, sorry. So my father was living in Tehran at the time. He grew up in the south, but at the time of the revolution, they had moved to the capital. And when they realized things were getting bad and they needed to move out, they needed to leave. They went back and they left and they made refuge through um, the direction of his hometown, through Kerman. They passed through his hometown and where he saw the house that he grew up in for the last time. And he covered and he crossed the border into Pakistan from Iran through mountains with his mother and with his sister. And they faced many challenges through mountains where they didn't know if the people that were helping them through would leave them there or would take what they had and kill them or whatever might happen if they would freeze, if something might happen to them and nobody would know. He was arrested multiple times and held in jails overnight so that just as a roadblock and until he was able to make it to Karachi and from there he was able to come to the United States as a refugee. So on my mother's side of the family, um, my maternal grandfather, he uh, studied medicine in Lebanon, actually. He, 
he was born in Aleppo, studied medicine in, in Lebanon. Um, and when he heard from his family that he was unable, it, it was very hard to get back in there. And anti-Semitism in Aleppo was really bad. Um, eventually, he he came to America. Um, that was like I think in '64. But on my dad's side of the family, I think it was 19. Uh, 1989. Um, I mean, throughout the 80s, the American government was putting a lot of pressure on the Syrian government to allow the Syrian Jews to flee. Um, you know, my mom always tells me these funny stories. My mom went to the Yeshiva Flatbush, and the students in school would write letters to the government um, to put pressure on them to help the, the Jews of Syria, of Damascus, to, to be fleed. And then her husband came on, <laughs> on, <laughs> on a plane in 95. But um, yeah, so. My grandfather was actually the, one of the last people of the community to be able to, um, to leave because he was a teacher. Um, a lot of the pillars of the community were, were given passports, um, like were the last ones to get passports because they wanted to keep the Jewish community there. Um, the Chacham Khamra was, was like the head, of the, the religious head, a figurehead of the community was also one of the last ones to leave. And also the Shafet, the butcher. Not the, but the person that kills the animals. Um, he was also the last one to leave because he also provided meat for the Muslims who follow halal, so they didn't want to let him go. <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they hopped on a plane as soon as they could. Even on their passports, it said um, Musa, which, which means like Jewish. Um, and, you know, I mean, they, they weren't thrown in jail or anything like that, but they were, they were allowed to go freely. But anyone who tried to, Flee prior to that was put in jail if they were caught, um, as I mentioned in the story earlier. But yeah. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, my great grandfather's family was able to flee in the night as the imam had warned them that there would be riots and they were, that their lives were in danger. And they were able to live briefly um, in Aden because it was a British port and it was safe over there within the walls of that city. Um, but they weren't able to stay for very long. And from there, they um, flew to Israel on Operation Magic Carpet. What a powerful way to end our time together. I want to thank the four of you again for giving us just a small glimpse into these stories of horror of atrocities but also of perseverance and resilience. And I think it's particularly powerful that this generation of Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews know about their history and they have become the torch bearers of the stories of their parents and grandparents. If we have more folks like these amazing women here, I have no fear and worry for the future of our people. So thank you again. And the last thing I wanna say is on the topic of the rising and the proliferation sorry, of anti-Semitism on college campuses, these are all students who are either in college or had recently graduated. Uh, just saying a bit more, uh, c connecting uh, to what Julia Jassy was saying, I believe, and after speaking to uh, our, our fellows, that um, one thing that can really address, a powerful thing that can address this bigotry and this ignorance is elevating the stories of Jews with deep roots in the Middle East and North Africa. Because so few people, even in these bastions of higher education, know about our stories, know about our deep rootedness in these areas. And maybe, just maybe, if they knew more about it, that would enlighten them. So let's continue doing the work of sharing our stories and supporting students like the ones here who are bravely sharing our experiences and stories. Thank you so much.